but then when I reached um, when I reached uh, junior college, uh, community community college, my first two years of college, everything that started to come out from me learning about chemistry, the basics of biology, um, anthropology, and even philosophy of ethics started to make it abundantly clear that all of the things that I was told in the past that gave me excuses to say, well, Christianity could still be true, they were just wiped the floor with. It turned out that so much of what I was told by previous pastors that gave me excuses of why I could still believe turned out to be completely negligent or over lies. Yeah, you see, um, for me, it was exactly the opposite. I come from um, an atheist background, meaning the entire country. And um, I went through the scientific education and I was doubting that it would be true. I was looking for a greater connection and, and um, meaning behind it all. But we have now David Conigliaro on, on, on air too. And I hit the record button because it's starting to get very interesting here and i would like to see what david has asked permission to be on air for what 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 what, what was your purpose of coming what i just had a question i i uh, i saw the title of the blab uh, biblical entrepreneurship and so i just wanted to see is that uh, is that christians in business or or is this a theological discussion uh is this um yeah, yeah, I was just curious what, 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 where we were going. My original intention was is to um, talk to um, convicted Christians about how to run their businesses so that religion doesn't stay in church, but we actually make an effort to apply in everyday life. But here on the blog, I got a lot of attention and it became very interesting to actually be present for anything that may come on my way because it all serves a good purpose but uh, basically what i would like to be able to do with each blob is to bring you a definition of biblical entrepreneurship and a short presentation of a topic then open it up for discussion and then open it up for more general um more general religion and atheism versus life kind of questions just theological now um is it is it a how do you pronounce it is that maya how do i pronounce what uh, your maya. first name is that maya yes maya uh where, where uh what country uh did you grow up in i grew up in hungary in eastern Bloc. okay and it, okay as soon as the wall and the um iron curtain opened up i actually was old enough to be independent and leave my country Therefore, my desire besides adventure, that was pretty obvious, <laughs> uh, was also that I had been, I really wanted to be in a country where people talk about God and to see how it was to live with people who knew God and who was God. That question has really proper, propered me because um, I didn't grow up in a nice environment. And both family and immediate environment was pretty hostile. And um, I felt like that it was not, not right. There had to be something better in the world. And it seemed to me like that people who knew God were a lot kinder to each other. Now, today I have seen enough in the world to, to know why I have been feeling that way. And I have experienced enough it is not necessary so. Uh, the older I get, a few decades later, I see that uh, Christians, yeah, they, in a superficial level, kinder, but they can be just as cruel to even each other. And um, there is a lot of um, aspects of the secular world that, um, that can um, be a lot more accommodating. So when I am when I have decided that there is a need for um, a place where entrepreneurs can entrepreneurs can fellowship, that's when I have founded 
my project of the lion-hearted entrepreneur. Now, it doesn't mean, um, it is basically because many Christians stop at the, the story of Jesus throwing the merchants out of the temple, right? Um, telling them that you turned my father's house into a marketplace. And that's all they, that's all their um, relationship to money and marketing. And there is plenty of marketers out there who don't want to hear religious platitudes. So you cannot really share with them your convictions and biblical principles either. And that's why I felt that there is a need for a community of Christians and entrepreneurs where we can relate to each other both spiritually and um, how we apply it to life in our work on the marketplace. Does it explain it a little better, David? Yeah, 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 that makes sense, that makes sense. Now, I have lost the picture on both Stephen and David. Um, that is a poor signal. I wouldn't say that um, there is a lot of support that I receive from different church leaders but there is a lot of controversy also so that's why i like to mention that too because if you start studying the bible and you really read it through from cover to cover with the mindset of an entrepreneur you discover that it is not only that a blueprint handed to us by god how to actually establish a, a homestead and an entrepreneurial business here on earth, but it is that becomes very clear for me that a true disciple of God today has to be an entrepreneur, has to be able to make use of his talent in an authentic way from scratch. If you are not willing to go through that journey, that authentic journey, like Joseph, um, Jacob's son, 11th son, being thrown into the pit, then sold into slavery, then put in prison and falsely accused before you ascend to your true potential, then you probably are not only not an entrepreneur, but you are really not really a disciple either. So that journey is completely necessary for both, both aspects of life. It is necessary for becoming a, a, a God-inspired and God-trained disciple. And it is also the story of a God-inspired and God-trained entrepreneur as well. The Cho Joseph with the coat. I am open for more questions, guys. Real quick, I just need to go grab something. I'll be right back. Okay. Hey, Maya. Yes. You know, I was just having this conversation uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, you know, because uh, a lot of times, you know, what you'll find is uh, even in the business uh, trainers, uh, business uh, motivational speakers or business trainers, uh, a lot of them try to kind of smuggle in kind of new age teachings um into their training programs um and to where there's um you know they kind of they kind of work a lot of yeast into this big batch of dough you know and uh i mean have you have you seen that as well Maya? um what what is what what is the metaphor for what do you use the yeast and do as a metaphor for if you just give me an indication i might can actually answer the question well, you know, um, a lot of people mix like two arts, okay, for example, where uh, the two arts shouldn't be, okay? And let me give you an example. Um, you know, I like Brian Tracy, let's say, or I like uh, Tom Hopkins, or I like maybe Tony Robbins, okay? Let's uh, let's use those three, because those are like powerhouse uh, sales, uh, sales personalities. But the problem is they kind of interweave uh, new age teachings, nuanced teachings, and then they, they interweave categories that shouldn't even be there. I'll give you an example. Sales, sales, sales is one thing. 
marketing is another thing. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sales are sales, is marketing's marketing. Well, somehow they they make these kind of one in a one in the same, or they make them so intertwined that they become uh, categorically synonymous with one another, and they're not they're not necessarily synonymous. And they do the same thing, you know, where they smuggle in kind of new age teachings. They're kind of empty platitude type uh, Eastern philosophies into their into their message, and it really bothers me. I'll give you an example. Uh, but, the law of attraction. Uh, just, yeah. I know it, yeah. I know exact terminology I use for that is truth versus truism. Okay, okay. Because there That's is fine. an inherent truth that should be spoken and truism that whether if it comes from Christian or Eastern religion or New Age background, wherever it comes from, it gets catches a fad, keeps being repeated, and then eventually actually mix misconstrues people's thinking it it is unhelpful it takes you all away from the truth truism i feel like is like try it sounds like truth and maybe in that moment it actually really when it's being used really hits a good nerve um in a good way but because it becomes like a gossip it got, starts spreading like like um what is it called um um a fad and then in all contexts and then there will be eventually a situation in my life i say that is actually conveying exactly the opposite that needs to be said here right now so um i see an awful lot of that on facebook and every single time i see something like that i just cannot pass it without telling them that you know, you need to you need to examine this new age truism very carefully because it can really damage you. Hmm. Can I? Can. I'll give you, I'll give you another example of what I've seen, like uh, uh, Brian Tracy or or. Uh, okay, your you sound know, and audio is really kicking in and out. I don't know how people perceive it as a, our listeners, but I, I am not able to hear you right now. Maya, I think you might have a poor connection because we can see and hear you clearly. And I, I can see David uh, very clearly as well. Hi, Steve. You, I, I can barely hear you too. I wonder what's going on. Are, are our listeners having a bad time for receiving audio as well? Or is it hey. maybe my equipment or something? Hey, hey Maya. Maya, where, uh, where do you live? Are you in the United States or are you still in Hungary? I I live in Hawaii. I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The Hawaii. Nice. Yes. Nice. There so might the be. Island can, the island, can. the island first reception sometimes can be tricky because we really are so cut off from any mainland influence. Your outgoing you can, signal. Jonathan, your, your outgoing signal is very clear, Maya. Um, Wonderful. So, and the incoming too. So I wonder what's going on. Hey, Steve, I got a question for you, buddy. Uh, you said that you, uh, your journey to atheism. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, okay, buddy? Yeah, I can. Um, I, I was uh, I was a I was a deeply committed uh, atheist for many many years. Um, in fact, uh, we, I was part of a secular humanist group uh, that would meet. And uh, we would, I mean, we were, we were pretty, we're, we're, I'm probably nothing to where you were or where you are because we were very uh, uh, militant, you know? I mean, I guess today you would call it activism, right? Uh, but we would, we would show up to churches uh, and, and wait for people to come out of church service and start debating them and, you know, attacking them as they were coming out of church service, um, you know, and I, I you um, that. that sounds like it could be fun. It, it, it was well. I'll tell you. It, you know, being I was much younger. I mean, you know, I was uh, I was I was twenty. I'm thirty seven now. Um, you know, back then I was twenty. So I came out of atheism about age at the age of twenty three. And I'll tell you, it, looking back, I mean, it was funny to do it. It was funny, but I, I don't think it, it really made people uh, just really angry. Just cause, probably because of the way our approach and our tone and our demeanor and our you know every the way that we would go about it you know but uh, i had a question for you buddy um would you say how would you define your atheism and, and the reason i'm going to ask it this way because I, I i hope this makes sense because um would you say that you would define atheism as there is no god or gods or would you define it as 
not knowing if there is a God or gods or uh, a lack of a belief in God's existence? Or would you say you have a belief without gods, um, without God or gods? Or would you say you have a rejection of any type of God of any kind of description? Okay, so my, my response, my answer is going to be... Um, I would say very clear and logical, but um, there are some facets to it that's not too easy to, to follow along with. So bear in mind, I will repeat anything that needs repeating um, to help clarify. Um, but so something I've been coming I've been coming to understand in a lot of these talks is that when it comes to a acceptance of something is true, uh, a, a belief claim, um, there are multiple ways to to look at it as more than just being black and white. Either it's true or it's not true, or you think it's true or you think it's not true. Um, there's also, I don't know. And then there's also, um, in a lot of cases, like when it comes to God claims, if I heard Maya tell me what she believes in, uh, in fine detail, and then I heard what you believe in, in fine detail, even though the two of you might accept the same title as Christian, you might even decide that the same denominational track of Christianity applies to you. But I would guarantee that when we get down to the nitty gritty specifics that what you would both be presenting to me are two very specifically and fundamentally different God claims. So to say in a general sense, I would consider myself atheist in the sense that so far when it has come to claims of theism, um, I have either found problems with the definition of what makes something a God to like, like maybe somebody saying the universe is what I define as God. And that's somehow yeah, supposed to be yeah. a convincing argument. Um, right. or there has been, um, not enough information to support the belief, not enough evidence to support the belief, or in a lot of cases there can be deliberate contradiction, right? Now, if I really can, can, I, can I can I ask you a, a since you brought that up, can I ask you a, a kind of a, a similar? Uh, well, I, I think it's just going to piggyback on what you just said. I'm not I'm not I'm not making a claim about you. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm just asking a question. Okay, you with you still with me? Mm -hmm. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I can hear. You. Um, do you act? Do you behave and act in accordance with what you believe? or with what you don't believe in? Uh, for example, would you say that you act according to what you do believe, mm. or do you say that you act as according to what you don't believe? I, I act in accordance with what I believe to be true. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, just, I, I just wanted to clarify. Keep going. And then, so I didn't mean to cut you off. I just right. I was just curious. Right. So, so when it comes to the God claims, which I find contradictions, like inherent contradictions inside them, I would say, I know those to be false, lest there is something wrong with the law of non-contradiction that, that I, I accept as a, a valid axiom uh, to start with. Um, but do you, think, uh, do you think that it's inconsistent uh, for someone who lacks belief uh, in God uh, to work against God's existence by attempting to show that God doesn't exist? Um, let me see. I don't know if I can say there's contradiction per se in that, but if you're asking if I am presenting the argument that I know that no gods exist, I'm, I, I wouldn't say that. In that sense, I'm agnostic. Okay. 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 In that sense, you're agnostic. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, guys. Um, I have been paying a little attention to what's going on on the side, and there are actually questions regarding biblical entrepreneurship that I would like to address. If you don't mind, I would like to shift the tone of this conversation a little bit in subject. Because Elijah Harry is really debating me whether if scripture and business is actually contradictory and cannot mix. And I told him that I can prove him otherwise. And why that is, is because business is nothing else but service to others out of compassion 
and God is the author of both compassion and service to others. Therefore, God is the author of love and business. It is possible to serve others with God's love and be rewarded for it and be profitable. God explicitly tells in different parts of his word of the scripture that he wants profitable um, servants in his kingdom. What does God even do? He transforms hearts, Elijah. He's hey, Maya. Yes. Maya, uh, Steve, I, I just, uh, I've got to run. Um, I promised my wife I'm going to go to dinner. It's, uh, it's a birthday. So um, uh, it was good. It was good talking to you guys. It was good meeting you guys. I appreciate yes. the conversation. Thank you for visiting. Yeah. I'm going to come free again. up my chair now. Come again. So what I'm trying to convey here, what does God, what is business is, what is God's business is to transform hearts. The way I have come to know God is that he is the ultimate alchemist. And here I don't talk about witchcraft, sorcery, or magic, or any dark sciences. Here I talk about a relationship chemistry between you and the person who is actually creating you as we speak. He is the one, the alchemy is the science of taking a lesser quality element and through the power of word, transforming it into a higher quality element. And that's exactly what I see God does throughout the Bible. Takes a, a, a wicked heart, a lower quality heart, a sinful heart, and through the power of his word, he transforms into a heart that he can dwell in as the ultimate source of goodness and love. That's what I see God is in the business of furthering his kingdom. Now, if you know the original origin of the word heaven, heaven means the dwelling place of God. Wherever he dwells is called heaven. If you have a relationship with God and you have hand, gave him your heart, he asks you to make space for him in your heart and he dwells in your heart. Then logic logically, inevitably, your heart becomes a heaven, a place where God dwells. That's the, that's the way God promotes his own kingdom and the transformation in this world from a wicked world reaching out towards the world that is the place of ultimate love. And if I was to be wrong, then where would love come from? It's certainly not from a world where you look back in historically and you saw all the wickedness because good and evil cannot come from the same source. When, um, it cannot come from the same source, good and evil. They have to come from a different source. Where does hunger come from? Well, read. You need to know that when men sinned, God has cursed the ground he stood on. Not because he was angry and not because he wanted to punish the innocent earth, ground, and all its inhabitants, the animals, but because of his love for man. When man sinned, he could not any longer live in heaven. That is a holy place. He needed a place to dwell. And he, God has given man Eden, the Garden of Eden, which was located on earth originally, is to keep it, to be the steward of that garden. Now, when man has failed to be a good steward, Unfortunately, he dragged with himself all that was pure Eden into destruction and into the curse as well. Right now, and, and Satan, who was responsible for tempting the woman and the man and for causing sin, therefore, in their life, has been also, before it has been casted out onto earth. 
So now we get to live in the same place as Satan lived. Okay, really quick. And it is a cursed world. That and 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 human body is run out of energy, and so you got to be hungry at some point. Really quick, Maya. Um, yes, please. I just wanted to make sure because um, I know some of these comments in the chat are are aiming towards the direction of of asking you about what it is that you believe. I, I wanted to make sure that you actually got the chance to do your presentation as you wanted to. Remember, you wanted to do your presentation first. Yes, I I have a really hard time understanding your audio. And that's why I'm looking like somebody who doesn't really get it. But I, I if I have heard you well enough, you are telling me that you would like to give me a, a chance to do my presentation. Yes. And that is a it would be a really good point. Um I have like to um address some of those who were here, yes. Um, let me let me see what I'm doing here. Now, this is about a, nine, a, a 15 to 20 minute presentation and I have titled it the Here to Heaven, the journey from here to heaven. Today's presentation is about finding the core truth of the journey. We are here starting a whole new chapter in our lives. Even if you don't know it yet, you are starting a whole new life right now. The destination is heaven. In this presentation, I would like us to discover and elevate the very essence of the core of this journey from here to heaven is entirely in every step of the way, a kingdom walk. Where every step in mindfulness of God's will, you um, you will be on a holy ground, upheld by his grace, truth, and mercy. At every part of the journey, regardless where it takes you, keep remembering you and your soul's everlasting life is God's most precious possession. And keeping you on the salvation team is his highest priority. Don't ever forget that. No matter where you stand right now or any time during your walk, no matter how great is your vision, the view, the sight, God always has a bigger picture to behold. The extent and the magnitude of your conviction in God's truth is your power. Therefore, don't be a minor holding up a minor power. Raise yourself and your conviction. Raise your standards. The purpose of religion in my life is to transform me into a better human being, a better heart bearer in the name of God. The purpose of becoming a better heart bearer for God is to glorify him who created and saved me. To glorify him needs me to give credit to him for the beauty and righteousness of my character. For that, I need to humble myself and accept that I'm not my own creation. I did not save myself and I'm not the life that lives within me. The only glory I may bear is by surrendering all glory to God. The ultimate question of my life and worldly mission is how will I glorify my creator? Thou the all-knowing God already knows and generously supplies supplied and provided me already with all necessary talents, power of character traits, journey plans, resources and opportunities. It is up to me and my free will to actually choose to use the will. Will I be using all my talents? Will I be replying on a will? Will I be relying on a will of God Will I be willing to improve my character in the likeness of his? Will I be willing to walk the journey put before me to train and teach me of higher service? Will I be willing to explore and mind out, then use all of my resources? Will I be willing to take action each and every opportunity to he brings me? Will I be willing to serve others even in heaven? 
how will I serve my God? is not a Sunday or Saturday scheduling question. It is a whole week commitment. Therefore, what I do for business, that is my service to others and their needs to be, it needs to be put, my service needs to be put under the microscope. Can I find relevance of my work in the Bible? And how do I find the biblical principles in my work? God's business in one short term is building his kingdom. It is his enterprise. He is the ultimate entrepreneur, raising souls and building their future dwelling place. While today God dwells within my heart, soon before I even know it, my heart and soul will be dwelling in his heaven. God makes me into a better human being, a better heart bearer. He takes my lesser quality sinful heart and transforms it into a higher quality heart. One that may even be fit for heaven and for service even there. This is a process. And I wonder if anybody here can name me the process that takes a lower quality element and by intention and the power of word transforms and creates a higher quality element. Yes. This is commonly called alchemy. And here I do not use the word in the context of dark sciences, magic, sorcery, or witchcraft. I use the word alchemy in this material and in all of my materials as a word strictly to describe relationship chemistry and find all physical scientific references as various metaphors. God created this world, all of it biology chemistry and all forms of natural sciences therefore are his medium he is the ultimate scientist i will not ever refer to alchemy as a science marred and corrupted by satan for that is sorcery magic witchcraft and all such dark forms of manipulations of power that is the environmental condition of alchemy in the context of god what is the environmental condition of alchemy in the context of God? I don't believe it is possible outside of a relationship with God, to be honest. You need to have a however weak or strong relationship with God established or novice level. If you feel the draw, you are seeking a truth. You are striving to understand a greater intelligence or you are thirsting, hungering salvation and the words of his mind, you are in chemistry. That is all love relationship. Be, that's how all relationships begin, with interest. The, the very word magic gives away that Satan is not inventing anything new, but stealing from God. Magic is his version of God's miracles. The philosopher's stone is nothing else but the sorcerer's version of the cornerstone and his living stones. When the magician talks about the four base salts, he is, he is talking about Jesus' word. Ye are the salt of the earth. And we could go on and certainly we'll go on with this, these revelations at another occasion. But when Jesus said, I will go and turn these hearts of stone into a heart of flesh. He didn't just mean to concoct mercury, copper, and sulfur into gold. What he had in mind is to raise up heart, raise up a heart in his people that give way to their everlasting life with him. He is the business in the business of turning hearts into stone, stone hearts into flesh and hearts of flesh be inhibited by living souls. From the moment you are born, you are dying. But God created Adam to be a nefesh, a living soul. When he breathed his breath into him, Adam became a living soul. Sin cut Adam's seed off from the life. But Jesus has given that life back to those who love him. 
Jesus is perfectly well versed in the alchemical processes of heart transformation and gave us his Bible to make it our own. He isn't speaking it over our head or made it into ceremonies, rites, and traditions. He hands us the Bible to make it our own, of our own efforts, because to have the desire to seek him in his word and never hold back the drive to do so and testify for him, that also testifies for our own fervent love for him. You can't prove him your love if you don't seek for him. If you love someone and they are lost in the forest, you will be running very fast to wanting to find them. That's exactly how we're supposed to look for Jesus. It is most important for God that you declare your salvation by Jesus, that you adopt his ways and character as your own and how you serve others here on earth. And my mission is primarily concerned about this topic of the service to others. You know, Christmas has just passed and I did not have a fireplace in my house. Therefore, I turned on the laptop every day before I went to bed and was uh, watching the YouTube Zhulog recordings. And I discovered that warmth, ambience, and the smell of the fire will not come through to me from the screen. Many of us are sitting in front of our virtual fireplaces, inspecting it and expecting an actual experience of the real fire. It is the same with business. Our senses are denied of the aroma, the warmth, the ambience, unless we are willing to build a real fireplace. Creating a business and leaving God out of it is like watching the fireplace from the computer screen. I accept God as the ultimate provider of all earthly and heavenly wealth. Therefore, he cannot be an expendable, absentee, or more side, some sidekick partner in my ventures. God loves me, who rely on him entirely and rewards me who, because I'm someone who do service to others in his name. Service to others can be voluntary something that your churches and organization gets plenty of opportunities for. And you can also make a spontaneous service to others on your own initiative as well. But the facts of life is that most of us have to work for our living and to provide for those whom we love. And to have means to do so, you need an income, ideally a profitable business. It shouldn't be a burden for a true believer, but a but a valuable training, a test, an exam, and an adventure in growing intimacy with our creator. That is the ideal mental attitude. But we all need a supportive fellowship community to support us. Now we can be very well planted in our local churches. We will rarely find actual people that can relate in an enriching way to our unique entrepreneurial experiences. And in the marketing world, we will very rarely find people who are openly ready to share their hearts for Jesus. Therefore, there is a great need for a community that I have envisioned in my project name, The Lionhearted Entrepreneur. And we will walk, we will talk about that more in the end, a little bit of toward the end, end of that presentation. If you are in business, marketing your own product, gift, skills, or packaging it together with other people on a team, you are practicing what I call the artist of caring and solutions. When you do so, you are an entrepreneur. Who is an entrepreneur? The word itself has been coiled in the 1700s France during the Industrial Revolution and referred to innovative individuals who had seen the opportunity for service and were willing to go way out of their way, even overboard sometimes, paying the ultimate price for providing service to others in need. They had to find the solution. Yet besides their compassion 
and adventurous creative spirit and will, they did not necessarily had the means to bring that solution to those needing it the most. Therefore, besides the industry providers, they had to also find the owner of capital necessary and turn those influential and valuable investors into financial sponsors. Everybody here was primarily concerned about them making profit. Now, that has become a model for the next more than two centuries. Now, the entrepreneurial archetype is more, much older than two to three hundred years old. It is recorded in the Bible itself from the very time the first man created a homestead or the blessings of the Abrahamic lineage, for example. And I discuss many more in my course in the history of entrepreneurship in great detail. But I would call this past two to 300 years, the old paradigm era, even if it is the youngest and quite recent, simply because of its profit, service and ownership modality. I would like you to be informed that there are great efforts made in the world today by outstanding individuals to influence progress before, beyond this old paradigm and allow new modalities to emerge. Here at the Lionhearted, we are in, intending to do our own lion share of the process on behalf of God's heavenly kingdom and in a fundamentally new way. That is the most ancient way ever recorded. We are preparing ourselves for a new shift for social and economical renewal. If you have ever heard my favorite quote that has actually been spoken by Billy Graham, that God is about to do his next greatest miracle in the marketplace, then you are up to date on the most important news that actually matters on earth right now. The major differences between entrepreneurship and biblical entrepreneurship is described in my fireside metaphor. More significantly, the warmth and the smell, the aroma of the fire cannot be conveyed any more from a computer screen than the joy of heavenly treasures can be felt in the business void of God. Making a living or creating an everlasting living is a huge difference. A fulfilling life today and leaving a lasting legacy you can be proud of for a future true Christian and follower of Christ is only possible in biblical principles that are applied every step of the way. But how can you apply these principles if you don't know about them? Which is why I have created the Lionhearted community for fellowship, Bible study, and exceptional resources for independent kingdom exploration courses. Our mentorship, I dare to say, is absolutely singular art and uh, not known anywhere else in the world. If you have the desire to serve God in his way in the world, then you will never need to surrender ownership to him. Your business goal will have one focus and goal, and that is to further the kingdom of God. And with faithful application, you will soon become a steward of a kingdom business and work to glorify God. You will be fulfilled because God only creates masterpieces. You cannot possibly go wrong. Now, you guys probably have noticed that I have been reading this. And simply because my prompter <laughs> is down and I am feeling a little tired today and I didn't want to miss anything that I have thought of before. But if you have heard of the term that is currently spreading in the, um, what is it called? Um, corporate world. There are entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. Intrapreneurs are actually equivalent of contractors and subcontractors.
Now, if you make God your entrepreneur, the owner of your business, that it becomes the kingdom business. You are furthering his purposes on earth and you become an intrapreneur. That is just my way of organizing my message a little better so it is more available. Any questions you guys may have um, regarding my presentation about biblical entrepreneurship, this is the time to speak up. Anything that would need clarification. The way I have come to create the biblical entrepreneurship and the lion hearted as my brand was born out of personal need. I come from very humble beginnings. And even in church, after giving my life to God, I had and tithing, I have felt no change and no, I didn't see any difference in the way of the quality of my life improving. In fact, it just getting was getting doomer and doomer and doomer. So I have come to the realization that tithing in itself is not enough. And you cannot possibly tithe with the intentions of God is, you are investing into God and he's going to repay you for your faithfulness. That actually happens. But God wants you to give him your tithe because that way you acknowledge him as your business partner. You cannot expect him to be your supporter if you don't support him. It is just a relationship. It goes back and forth. But there is a whole lot more to it than just tithing. It is, for example, the fact of accepting that God wants you to be profitable. It, the old mindset of, oh, the poor in spirit are also supposed to be poor on earth is outdated. It doesn't work. There are plenty of people in the world today who are proving it for me personally that you, just because you're a Christian, you don't have to live in financial insecurity. Being a good disciple doesn't mean that you have to struggle and sweat blood in order to make your living. Exactly the opposite. When Jesus sent out the disciples the first time, told them to take a staff, staff a cloak, and no purse with them on the journey. Why? They, did they not need money? Did they not need sustenance? Yes, they did. But out of confidence and trust for God. And he was there with them. It meant that if they were doing God's work on his behalf, they will be provided for. The second time he sent them out, he already knew that he was not going to be with them because he's going to be crucified and descend. So he told them to take with themselves a stuff, a cloak, and a purse too. That is still a mystery for me. But basically, if he was not with them, they were going to need, need to be able to um, re reserve some uh, worldly riches for the times of lack, because it is a spiritual law in our world that every time of plenty is followed by a, a, a time of lack. When you take a purse with you, it is the symbol of saving some of your plenty for the time of lack, therefore being proactive it, if it is a spiritual law that we know every time of plenty will be followed by a, a time of lack, it shouldn't catch us by surprise. There is no excuse. That is the whole story of Joseph with his, um, the one, Jacob's 11th son for whom he sewn that special cloak for. That entire story is about. He interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams to be that there was going to be time of plenty and time of lack and that they needed to store up the grain um, for 
for the time feeding those in the time of lack feeding the whole country and they saved up so much that they could feed even beyond the boundaries of their country which is how jacob and his other 11 sons found a way to joseph to buy food there was nothing on earth the only source and resource was what jo joseph saved up in the storehouses of pharaoh and that's where I feel that's why Jesus had told his disciples when he sent them out the second time to take with themselves a purse so that they would have a place to save up in the time of plenty for the time of lack. Now, many of us think that Jesus was poor because he lived simple. He did not have luxuries. He's focus was on his mission but if you read carefully especially in the story of where Mary Magdalene washes Jesus's feet no not Mary Magdalene one of the Marys washes um, his feet wipes it with her hair and opens a very expensive um, bottle of oil and pours it over his feet in that parable Judas is grumbling that it could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Now, guess what? Jesus, uh, um, Judas, besides his intentions weren't as pure as he makes it sound like, is being in that parable named Jesus' treasurer. Now, first, a few things have to be stopped and contemplated here because first of all jesus had a treasurer have you ever heard of a poor person who needed a treasurer because i haven't usually people who have treasurers are those who need somebody else to carry the responsibility or take care of their money therefore that means that they have a lot of it jesus was not a poor person he just didn't put it in the forefront he wanted to relate to the poor people and he and he was relating to the poor people he was relating to those who were lost who were needy they were his people his nation so he kept it simple and what happens here is we discover that jesus had a treasurer therefore he had to have a lot of treasures worldly ones too in the form of coins in fact because when he was feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000, the first thing the, the those big nations we have been gathering around him, the first thing was is that his disciples came to him and told him that he they didn't have enough money to feed them all. Even if they spent all their money in the village nearby, they wouldn't have enough money to feed them all. That means that they did have money and that they were prepared to feed the hungry on a daily basis but not in the size of four to five thousand which is why the miracle has come about jesus has prayed to the father and uplifted the bread and the fish in order to multiply it not to feed himself but of to feed others which is the miracle even why the miracle has even taken place god will provide you much to give much a god does not provide you with much in order to um gather it for your own it all treasure your treasury belongs to god when you are a kingdom building entrepreneur your treasury is god's treasury not just the 10 percent that you take to church so his household would be maintained when you become a biblical entrepreneur you understand that yes you take us for your own needs to be met and you save for yourself also for the time of lack just like the disciples were to save but ultimately everything you have belongs to god and I could put it into first person. Everything I have belongs to God. Everything that is to 
my resource is available for me to do my project of the lion-hearted biblical entrepreneur belongs to God. Now here on Blob, every day at two o'clock, I like to share the word of God. I like to bring people into the gospel and into the spirituality that enlivens me. But um, I especially created this project for those who share the need I have had when I started this whole business. And I have invested into this business for over two years now. I am very determined to not to stop but keep going. There has been nothing to stop me until now, and I cannot imagine all that many things that are going to stop me beyond this point either. Simply because I am so convinced that there is a need for, a, for people to fellowship together who believe in Jesus as an incredible entrepreneur and um, drawing people toward the kingdom of God as well as you're supposed to be a profitable businessman on behalf of God. Why? One of the examples from the Bible is Matthew 25, the three servants with their talents. Shortly to recap is, there is the landlord who um, has three servants and he's about to go away to travel and he gives one of the servants five talents, the other one two talents and the third one one talent. And then he leaves for a long journey. Upon his return, he asks them, the first servant said, you gave me five talents and I invested it and I made five talents profit for you, Lord. Here is all the 10 talents for you. And the Lord rejoices and says, oh, you blessed and good servant, you have entered the joy of the Lord. The second servant says, Lord, you have given me two talents and I have invested it and I made two more talents. Here is four talents for you. And he is all, the Lord also rejoices over him. But the third one who was given only one talent tells the Lord, I knew that you were a shrewd uh, Lord and you want to reap where you have not sown. Therefore, I dug away your one talent in the ground over there. Go and get it yourself. Basically, that's what he tells the Lord. And the Lord turns around and says, you um, wicked servant, if you knew that I'm going to reap, but I have not sown, you should have at least given it to the merchants and um, to the bankers. And I could profit from the, what is it called? Um, ah, <laughs> run my, I could profit that way. And um, the Lord responds to him, because you have been a wicked servant, you do not enter the joy of the Lord. And outside of the joy of the Lord, there is only one option. He's out in the darkness and cold with the gnashing of teeth and he's being thrown out. He told him, you were a wicked and unprofitable servant. You, have, you need to live in the darkness with the gnashing of teeth. Now, if that doesn't wake up a Christian entrepreneur that he's supposed to make use of his talents and be profitable on behalf of God's kingdom, then nothing will. This is one of my favorite parables to share with people because this is so powerful. You have to understand, even the King James Version gives you the vocabulary of you got to be profitable. That's not a New Age translation. That is the King James Version. You're supposed to be profitable. And when you work with God and you do his will and you follow his footsteps, you cannot be anything else but profitable because God only does masterpieces. He does not do junk. And God finishes what he started. That is one of the giveaways. God is all-knowing. He always knows whether is something is going to be successful or not. Therefore, he does not start a process or a project that he cannot finish. If he started it, he's going to finish it. If something goes unfinished, that was not the work of God. That was somebody's 
selfish agenda and project that he started of his own account. God finishes what he started. Is anybody here who would like to ask a question or join me on air? Okay, I'm not getting all that much responses. I wonder if you guys um, just want to listen. At least give me a clue what you want to hear about because I pretty much um, said so much already. Is there a particular topic you want to hear more about or a question? Well, thank you very much for all the claps. And up loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like them too. And that is wonderful to know that people uh, enjoy what I have got to offer. But please help me out with your questions because I have got a very large area to cover. I can see that most of the people calling today are from the United States which is especially makes me glad because I love the United States. I live here and my message, even though it's applicable all over the world, I mostly feel that it is in the need of the United States. If I wanted to elaborate a part of it is why do I do I this work? At one point in my journey of being in the pit, <laughs> financial and existential pit of my life, I have realized that um, God understands and God wants us to be both disciples and profitable disciples. And that is exactly the same as being an entrepreneur, a biblically, biblically minded and lion hearted entrepreneur and what do i mind by biblically minded in philippians 2 5 jesus says to take ask us to i'm going to read it properly um philippians ask us to take his mind upon ourselves that is the true gift of heaven to think like jesus Everything in life starts with our thinking. We can imagine it if we can envision it, envision it, and the way we think about it is in our thought. It starts, that's the, that's the ground of seeding. That's where we seed and we reap with our hands. Now, um, the fruits of every thought, we reap with our hands the fruits of every thought. But... Let me see if I find Philippians so I can read it for you exactly as it is. Here it we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I'm going to start a little bit above the text because 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to put it into context for you. I'm going to read a little bit before and after that line. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, in any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
thought of not robbery to be equal with but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even death of the cross that is the jesus mind and there is a lot in that one verse but the entire bible teaches us about ultimately of how the mind of god and jesus works what lives in their mind while for religion in my life the purpose is to transform my heart from a lower quality heart to a higher quality heart through relationship with god and his word it is also goes hand in hand with the transformation of the mind there is no transformation of heart without a transformation of the mind this is not about fanaticism it is about understanding being conscious of a human beings not fanatics on behalf of god's kingdom therefore going between the extremes of throwing away all worldly possessions yeah i'm not saying that you shouldn't be giving to the poor and you can give them all you've got but um but but being mean to people of money and earthly riches that doesn't make any sense either because that those riches are also provided by god how they are being used okay what, what i really want to get to here is an entrepreneur has the ultimate goal of create making a living for himself and if he's a really good human being he will want to make a living for himself and others as well but it, when it comes to biblical entrepreneurship, we want to make everlasting living, not merely earthly profits, but also heavenly profits at the same time. In fact, our earthly profits are nothing else than um, the heavenly profits Earthly profits are nothing else than um, provisions in order to acquire heavenly profits, heavenly treasures. Jesus very clearly said is that not to aspire to gather treasures here on earth where moth and um, rot can get to them and robbers can rob us of it, but to gather treasures in heaven where they will be everlasting. And that is also an entire speech in itself what those heavenly treasures are anybody um yes jonathan kiss you are very welcome to ask me questions i don't really know what hi maya would you say that there is a general limit to how much you can reasonably take in for your work, such as anything more than you make above that amount should be considered a responsibility placed on you to help make the world a better place? If yes, that amount would you get, what amount would you guess is a reasonable limit to set before your income should be seen as a responsibility? That's a very good question. Um, Steve, Jesus has been committed to his mission. He wanted to be able to, re to be relatable by his audience. So he kept a very simple life. Besides the fact that he really didn't have the need for too many worldly possessions. And that becomes pretty clear when you step on a mission that your life becomes a lot, um, lot simpler. Let me give you an example from my life. I have been an artist, a fabric artist, and I needed a studio in order to do my spinning and weaving and fabric and quilts, and it needed space. So an equipment, 
and I created beautiful things that sold for would have sold for really good money because they were very valuable. So um, if you choose to be a fabric artist, that is a necessity, right? If you choose to be um, a cook, then you need a kitchen or whatever. What is your place of work and evangelism? But as soon as I became an online entrepreneur, as much as I loved my studio and workshop, I have started attending it so little and eventually barely ever visited my studio and I'm still crazy about my art. But it became less than it became more and more burden to maintain the rent and all that belonged to it came with it without actually ever spending time there anymore. So I started selling it. And today I would say I'm so grateful. I have the skills and I have that experience of being able to live uh, out my artistic inspirations. But I don't have the need for it all that much because I have a new vision for myself. And that is mainly to educate people about biblical entrepreneurship. And everything I need really now is my laptop and my bed. I really don't have a need for all that much more. I need a way to be heard, which is mostly online. And if I decide to advocate for the local churches, I actually write them letters. And if they invite me, I don't need much. I just need to walk up stage and speak. But um, depends what is your medium that you work with. When I had my studio, it was a lot of worldly riches in there, beautiful things and quilts and fabrics. Now I live a lot simpler. And that actually naturally happened. I didn't make an effort to give all that up. All of what I had given up and the proceeds of it went 100% into my new vision and mission is building my website, creating my message, um, hiring mentors and coaches in order to make myself even better at what I want to be doing because this was my new passion. I still love fabric, but now my new passion is in evangelizing for biblical entrepreneurship. Does that make sense, Steve? And if you want to quantify it in money, it would be really hard for me. But I can tell you that there is no human being who needs to maintain a lifestyle of $2 million a month. Um, it is, it, it, it has, it's kind of all individual. Some people might need $1,000 a month. Others need um, $2,000 a month. But I cannot Im imagine a human being that would be so high maintenance that they would be needing the ridiculous amount of money. Everything else, I, you are steward over. It means nobody holds, nobody can take that away from you, but God. And nobody can um, tell you what to do with it either. It's between you and God. In, in the eyes of the world, you are owner of those riches. You are the owner of that money. It's yours. But it is a, a covenant between you and your creator, your entrepreneur boss. How are you going to use it? If you want to buy 2 million pencils for poor children in Africa, you can do that. If you want to hunt down criminals in the third world countries so that, that um, criminals who rob orphans from their organs can you believe that i have i have not long ago have heard about it i read it on facebook and i talked to individuals who know about this crime they go to third world countries and they chase down on the street children very often teenagers orphans and cut their living organs, their vital organs, out of their bodies while they are still alive and leave them on the street to bleed to death. And they have, they have coolers with them to put them in, that, that in, into it, the, the organs and they, they go off with helicopters. Now, if that's not sick, 
I don't know what it is. If you decide to, to raise money for hunting down criminals like that, you might found a partner in me because I'm very fired up about that project that I had envisioned. I think in this world, we really have to raise money to end such an evil. But how you use the profit that God gives you is entirely up to your conscience and how he moves your heart. Steve, I see my personal limit is 150,000 give or take. 150,000 a year? Is that a year? Now I plan to be philanthropic after I reach 40,000 annually. <laughs> you are cool. I think 40,000 annually is very reasonable in current America. I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that one. There was uh, about two or three years in my life when I had earned 41,000 a year. And I wasn't living in huge luxury. I also lived in, in a real uh, upscale um, neighborhood in California where rent was really expensive, but I had to live there because of my job was located there. So it, it, it only gave you like an average lifestyle. It, 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 it wasn't too much of a luxury. But I can tell you that if I, um, that, um, different people will have probably a different sum to their life because they might have children. And if they have like five, six children at home, they really don't want mom to work. So the, the man who is taking care of the family might want to come up with 150,000 to maintain the family year. Um, but it would be really wrong to fix it in a, in a sum, in an amount. It is up to everybody's own conscience. If God tells you that this or that is too much of a luxury, but you know, I personally feel like my physical need is, I tell you what, I have been for years dreaming of a hot tub in my house so that if I can't sleep at night, I can walk onto the porch and put myself in the hot tub and relax and go back to bed to sleep. For other people, it is, might be a luxury. But for me, it would be a necessity because I need to sleep and hot tubs are a better solution than any sleeping medication. So really, it is, it is all very personal. What did you say? Since Michael goes towards my family, I can't say the same. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I rode my bike through the hills of Laguna go out for a minimum wage both just because my parents lived there they lived paycheck to paycheck for their jobs yes um we we need to be able to have a savings account i like to say that a very important part of biblical entrepreneurship is to take care of oneself and this is how i would coach and help anyone who is interested to do it um, the godly way whenever you receive increase increase i want to say it again in your life it's if if you earn your money with um selling goods and you have a profit and you take it home that's an increase but if you have a car that you use for going to work and all of a sudden you sell it for five thousand dollars that's not an increase First of all, you need to reinvest it in a new car that runs. Second, you already tied for that money when, when you bought it in the first place. That is like returning your own money. Therefore, tithing is always after increase, the return on investment. Um, when you have an increase, you tithe 10% to God because he's your business partner and you acknowledge him that's his share he he is the provider of 100 percent but he only asks you for 10 percent now that's the kind of share partner i want to have in my on my board the other thing is 40 percent of whatever you bring home you want to save it in a savings account for a rainy day and here I would like to refer back again to the purse that Jesus asked his disciples to bring with them. 
saving in the time of plenty for the time of lack. It's absolutely essential. If you are not willing to take care of yourself, you're going to be having a really tough time. You won't be, um, be able to take care of yourself and your loved ones and your country like Joseph did in a time of lack. If in a time of plenty, you weren't looking forward um what was wasn't um how do we call it you you didn't have the pre pre the vision of saving your provision right that's why it is called provision it's professional vision really so 40 percent you set aside in a savings account for the time of lack and the remaining 60 percent you take out something for your personal use which is which is um rent and food and family and personal growth but personal growth is might be borderline because the rest of the money that you have left there of the 60 percent minus your um your personal expenses that you're supposed to reinvest into the kingdom of god it doesn't mean that you go and very quickly spend it on growth but you need a mentor a coach you need programs that enrich your service you want to grow you enroll in self-education or you start growing online and you reach more people on different social platforms because you have invested into it. You um, join in the joint ventures, and sometimes that even costs you money. Or you invest and reap um, ROI that way. Funny enough, I would be dishonest if I said that I dug myself out. Right now, I am thriving happily because of the homeless program for vets, which eventually became became me find it, finding a relationship with a great and loving woman who I am matched with in nearly every way. She also only thrived through luck until last year when she got a job in a medical fraud investigation well congratulations steve um you know um it is part of the entrepreneurial journey too um god um joseph's brothers have thrown him into the pit and robbed him of his coat and he sits there overnight all night through then they save him the next day out of the pit and spare his life because first intention was is to kill him but only god only says joseph to be sold as a slave then when he's a slave he learns to serve and see opportunities around himself but he's being falsely accused of a crime and he gets thrown into the prison. So God basically saves him out of one difficult situation only to put him into the next difficult situation and saves him from that difficult situation to put him into another difficult situation. Well, that's the journey. That's everybody's journey, whether if you're a disciple or an entrepreneur. Now God has saved you from one difficult situation and then also your somebody who you call the great and loving woman your girlfriend or wife or actually partner not the not quite the journey of a starving orphan though is it well you have been in war you deserve to do much better than a starving orphan you invested in protecting your country so no your country owes you but there is plenty of starving orphans out in the world who are going through the journey and very often they are being um while joseph was in the pit in slavery and in prison he was the starving orphan he didn't know 
during that time that he will ascend to be the governor of his country, Pharaoh's country. I would think a starving orphan deserves more than the fate of a starving orphan. Absolutely. And if you feel that way, you might want to do something about it. Act on it. I don't know about you guys, but I am kind of talked out for today. I have been going um, about two hours. As soon as I see an opportunity, I will create an empire for those who suffer. Uh, you can help in small ways as well, Steve. You don't necessarily need to. You can have the vision of an empire, but it kind of sounds like you are rather making a joke. <laughs> you can help in small ways. Now you have a good woman in your life. I don't know if you two are planning to have kids, but maybe the way to help the starving orphan is to adopt one. Just one life. God saves hearts one by one. I think um, I would like to prepare you guys that I'm pretty soon going to close down this chat room, this blob room. I really had a great time today. No joke. Actually, after our own kids, I want to encourage being a foster parent. Well, whatever works for you, uh, Steve. Just be, I, I thought the, um, you were joking with the word, word empire. But I didn't think that you would be joking with wanting to generously contribute to other human beings' lives. I think you're, um, you have a very genuine compassion for others. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think um, unless somebody wants to come up and have a conversation with me, I'm going to close this blob room. I agree, Steve. My family is known for fostering kids. I don't believe in adoption. I only believe in adoption as a really last resource because that is really a harsh um, intervention in someone's karma. But foster parenting should be a lot more popular than it is. Thank you, Steve. and. Thank you, everybody, coming today. It has been an incredible time. All those, all those uh, uploads are available um, back to you, too. If I had a way to um, send you hearts, I would send you hearts right now. I loved being here. This is the highlight of my day. Thank you for making my ministry and my work and my... Um, Life here on Blob, a very worthwhile one. It's very rewarding to be here and talk to you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much. Keep on going. <laughs> All right. Bye. See you tomorrow.